I hope you guys had a good break and that you didn't feel too overwhelmed by the details of that neuroscience and that you kind of just let yourself um, dive into the larger concepts. Uh, I hardly saw anyone using fidget toys. This is a great time to use your fidget toys. The more that you are somatically engaging with things, um, the more some of this is actually gonna land in your brain. So the more you're using some parts of your nervous system, the more able your other parts of your nervous system are to integrate information. So keep using those fidget toys. Uh, I got some really good data and information over the course of the break. I feel like my voice is about to go. So someone that has a background in singing told me to either go really high in my talking, um, and I sound like a Muppet, or go really low. And I think I'm gonna go for low. But what that's gonna mean is that it, this is gonna sound even more serious than it already does. And we've already had a lot less laughter today than I'm used to. So if I sound extra serious, just know that it's I'm trying to protect my voice. Um, and when, whenever I drop my voice, I always feel like I'm doing like a fake therapy voice. So I just want you guys to know that I'm not trying to like therapize the whole audience. I'm just trying to save my voice, therapize my voice. All right, are you guys ready to dive back in? This is another sort of neuroscience-y section. So fidget toys, concepts, that's what you're going for. Fidget toys and concepts. All right, so childhood trauma <clears throat> increases the risk of addiction, specifically IV drug use, by 4,600%. So just, I want you to just kind of sit with that number for a second and just like let yourself be with the heaviness of it. In this particular instance, childhood trauma is being defined by six or more ACEs. So it's a lot of ACEs. Six is a lot, it's not an average number of ACEs. And I don't know about you guys, but we do track ACEs where I work. Um, I actually think we could do a better job of it from a trauma-informed perspective, but at the Blackburn Center at Central City Concern, when people come into our substance use disorder program, we track ACEs, and our average number is six. So it's, it's not an unheard of number. What is unheard of is the 4,600%. So what that, how that translates is 46 times. So this isn't like twice as likely or 10 times as likely. It's 40 times more likely or 46 per 100 percent increase. And so what I want us to dive into today is thinking about that neurobiology of trauma that we did before break and then how does that translate to allow for this to be our reality. I think we're entering into a new time period where those narratives that we talked about from this morning are no longer the, the like commonly expected narratives around addiction. So um, I even heard some tables struggle to say, to, to not talk about social determinants and not talk about poverty because the, we're shifting the way we think about addiction. And in fact, I would think we're shifting so much that I wanna take a moment to celebrate. So ASAM recently put out a brand new, this year, ASAM, which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, they put out a brand new definition of addiction. How many of you guys knew or sort of know their 2011 um, definition of addiction? Uh, Steve, would you mind highlighting some of, <laughs> putting you on the spot? Um, let me see. Uh, substance use disorder is a primary, progressive, incurable, fatal, no-fault disease uh, characterized by relapse. Um, talk. Yeah, chronic was one of the things that they talked about. It's a progressive disease. Um, and then they talked about how it had um, spiritual the word spiritual is in there, uh, and a couple other things that sort of harken back to a different time in our understanding of addiction. And this year, they updated it. Addiction is a treatable, chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experience. <laughs> 
People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. So they shortened it, they made it much more succinct, and they added in this thing that I think is so incredibly powerful and an individual's life experiences. So they're starting to sort of nod. They're, they're like, they don't quite say it overtly, but they say, and an individual's life experiences can really influence whether someone develops um, addiction or not. And then of course they've got the nod to genetics, we know that's huge, the environment, and then brain circuits. And so much of what we're talking about is brain circuits. So I actually, I'm feeling really good about their new definition. I felt really not that great about their old definition and I would always use the Gabor Mate definition instead because it was really succinct and it just said it's any time you engage with substances or behaviors um, in a compulsive way to where harm is created and that's essentially what they've done here but then they've also said that it involves an individual's life experience so I think we should celebrate this a little bit. So when we go through the neurobiology what we're going to be talking about is the ways in which, again, trauma makes us more vulnerable to developing substance use disorders. And a lot of what we know about the connection between trauma and substance use disorders is based on the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the study because most people have usually, um, they usually have some fluency in the study or, or they know a little bit about it. Um, how many of you guys feel like you mostly understand the study? Um, you've heard about it a number of times, a little bit-ish. Okay, so I'll give you guys a quick overview. The ACEs study um, was a very large population-based study. It took, um, it took place in Southern California in the Kaiser population. And um, one of the PIs, Dr. Folletti, was actually charged with studying obesity and why people could lose weight but not keep it off. And through qualitative interviews, he discovered that often there was a connection between childhood experiences and weight later in life. It's funny because we now know that you can basically never lose weight with caloric restriction and not keep it off. We know that that's just like, there's not really any point in studying why that's the case because it's just so clear. You strict calories, you're gonna gain back even more weight later. But at the time, we didn't know that. And so he did these qualitative interviews to see what was going on with people and he discovered this correlation. So then they, they sort of transformed it and they did basically guessing, asking about common experiences that kiddos had had and then they looked at later in life health outcomes. And what they found was that, oh, that there was this overwhelming correlation between adverse childhood experiences and then health outcomes later in life. And again, so much of our understanding of trauma and even I would say trauma-informed care comes from the ACEs study. And so it's really powerful, but it's also really flawed. It's a really flawed study, which isn't a critique of the people that um, engaged in the initial study. But I think any time that we're so reliant on one piece of academic literature, we need to be asking questions about like who got left out, what doesn't it cover, etc. So just think for a second, this was Kaiser um, uh, 20 or 30 years ago now was the study, and they did these huge population studies, and they asked nine specific questions about experiences in childhood. And, and just think for a second, sort of internally, who got left out of this study? Non-insured people got left out. You had to have Kaiser, and this was before Kaiser was a Medicaid provider. So non-insured people. Predominantly white population. Employed. Yeah, so our, um, our undocumented folks were not included, absolutely, yeah. What's that? Oh, interesting, I didn't know that. It was predominantly female. Okay, that's good to know. And what about a whole bunch of people that experienced horrible things in childhood that just happened to not be included on that list of nine things? So they kind of pulled nine things out of the air because they were common, but when I think about the things that my clients have been through, sometimes they've been through awful things that just happened to not be included on that list of nine things. So 
while the ACES study is really important, and it gave us this number, which I, uh, this number, which I think is a really profound number, I also want us to just be thinking about the, all the stuff that we don't know because of it. We know very little, for example, about trauma in native communities. Potentially native communities have more ACEs, but what do we not know about protective factors in native communities? What do we not know about protective factors in Latino communities? I mean, there's just, there's so many things that this study leaves out. But what we're gonna try to do today is we're gonna dive into bad things happen, neurobiology to get shift and we be shifts and we become more vulnerable to substance use disorders. So a lot of people have looked at this and sort of talked about what's going on here. So we know that we've got adverse childhood experiences which becomes social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. We think that that's adoption of high-risk behaviors, including substance use disorders, which becomes disease, disability, and social problems, and then early death. But what we don't know, see those little arrows that say scientific gaps? We don't really know how that happens. And so what I wanna go through is the literature on how we think that happens. And I wanna call out that I think some of the most important um, new stuff around ACEs is really thinking about social location. So some of the stuff we've been talking today about trauma not being an individual experience. So there's been a lot of um, great work thinking about, just thinking about ACEs more critically um, and how we could build upon that in a way that's useful. So let's go back to the story about how trauma happens in the brain. And I want us to just sort of take off from that point and talking about the amygdala. So the amygdala, again, is responsible for turning on fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And it does all this stuff. It engages with the prefrontal cortex, and they talk to each other and decide whether things are gonna be a stress or a threat, whether we can self-soothe or whether we should not. Um, it turns on all those somatic experiences that you guys said you had when there was a stressor or a threat. Uh, it engages with sleep centers and it engages with pain centers. Oh, that's weird. So one of the things I wanna highlight first is just the role of the amygdala in self-soothing and how that translates to substance use disorders. So, Imagine that you had the experience that there was a cop in the rearview mirror and that hypervigilance was your baseline. That most days you woke up and your heart felt like it was a little bit uneasy, your muscles were a little bit tense, everything seemed extra scary, every scene, everything seemed like a threat. What is the fastest way you can get that experience to go away. things so that you're using your insides, your emotions, your connection to your mind, body, and spirit to heal yourself. So yeah. that's where the recovery comes in. That's really hard, which is why the substance use disorder feels really uh, difficult at times. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to, because you didn't have a mic the whole time, I'm going to try to just recap really quickly, which was um, people are going to use something external to self-soothe. Um, and that's part of why, part of the things that are missing from the definition potentially of um, a substance use disorder, and then it's also part of why recovery is really hard. So it's interesting that the, that the, initial, um, the initial response was about something external to self-soothe us, uh, and I appreciate it so much because often when I'm giving this talk, oh no, I forgot to go deep, because often when I'm giving this talk, uh, the thing that people say, because I'm mostly talking to behavioral health professionals, the thing that people say is to take a deep breath. And it's true, if you take a deep breath, you activate your parasympathetic nervous system and you turn off your sympathetic nervous system or your flight or fight or flight um, ever, ever so slightly, but you do do it. But that means that someone had to tell you how to self-soothe, that someone in your life had to say, 
here's this experience. It feels like this in your body, and here's how you get it to go away. And for so many people, that's a skill you learn. It's not something that you, you usually figure out. And so if no one's talked to you about self-soothing skills, or even if people have talked to you about self-soothing skills, I literally train people self-soothing skills and I still struggle with dopaminergic substances. So one of the core reasons that people develop a, a vulnerability to substance use disorders when they have a history of trauma is located in that sort of hyperarousal state that the amygdala causes because central nervous system soothers, their mechanism of action is to soothe the amygdala and make it feel safer. So if clients are engaging with benzodiazepines, um, any kind of opioid, alcohol, anything that soothes the central nervous system, they have found the perfect, usually very fast and relatively cheap way of turning off hypervigilance. And not just turning off hypervigilance, but also really like finding something that feels really safe. So I want you to imagine that you are a young woman, relatively high ACEs score. Um, you get pregnant at about 18, let's say. Um, and you don't have a lot of core body strength, and also no one's ever really talked to you about uh, stress management skills or self-soothing skills. Uh, you have a kiddo, new parenting, super stressful. How many of you guys have kids? How many of you guys remember those like first six months? And they're really hard, right? So first six months, really hard. Um, she starts to have back pain, or I should say you start to have back pain from bending over to change the diaper so regularly and things feel really stressful. And PS, you have a little bit of extra back pain because what's happening to your muscles when you're constantly in fight or flight? They're constantly tense, right? So you go to the provider. This, this wouldn't happen anymore, but 10 years ago, you'd go to the provider and the provider would be like, oh, you got some back pain? I have only 15 minutes to spend with you. I know exactly what's gonna help. Here's a prescription for oxycodone. Person goes home, takes an oxy, and feels safe and soothed, potentially for the first time in their life. So one of the core mechanisms is soothing the central nervous system, which actually allows us to feel more connected to other people. Because how many of you guys really want to like hug someone and process feelings in the moment, not after, in the moment when there's a stressor or a threat? Are you able to tend to someone and let yourself be tended to in those moments? So you get this immediate soothing, and then you get this sort of double layer where you feel safe and you're more able to connect with other people, or you've had replacement for connection with other people via substances. And connection with other people is ultimately the thing that makes us feel safest in the world. It's how our, our brains and our central nervous systems are wired to be. So I just want to review this really quickly. A brain that has experienced trauma is going to look for external things to self-soothe. That's the brain that has experienced trauma has been primed to think about external things. And then let's go next to thinking about something else that fits in, sort of fits into this puzzle and helps explain more of why we do this and why we look for the specific substances we do to soothe. So the brain that has experienced trauma has a hypersensitivity to dopamine. And then let's break this down a little bit. Do you remember when I showed you all those things that long-term cortisol does? And one of them was it decreased cortisol levels? Sorry, cortisol decreases dopamine levels? Okay. So the brain that has experienced trauma has lower dopamine levels. And because the dopamine levels are lower, it makes us more sensitive to dopamine. It means dopamine is more powerful on the brain that has experienced trauma. But that doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't yet understand dopamine. So let's take a moment and talk about what dopamine is. <laughs> 
So we talked for a second earlier. The way that we mostly have talked about dopamine is we talk about it as pleasure and reward. How many of you guys, when I say dopamine is about pleasure and reward, that's the way that you also understand it? That's the way you've talked it. That's how you've talked about it being heard. So we think of dopamine, specifically in this brain area called the nucleus accumbens. We think of dopamine as being the thing that allows things to feel good, and because they feel really good, then that's rewarding for us, and so we'll find more of it. And so when you think about dopamine, what I want you to be thinking about is about learning and memory, because dopamine says this thing feels good, it's rewarding for us, and so we're gonna find that thing and we're gonna come back to it. Dopamine is the thing that says, that's good, remember where it is, remember how to get it, and keep coming back as many times as you can. But I want us now, everyone feel pretty solid on what dopamine does in our nucleus accumbens? Tells us find the thing, come back to it over and over again, and keep engaging with it. But I want us now to take sort of an ancestral perspective and put it over and think about what dopamine meant for us back in the time period when cortisol and catecholamines really allowed for our survival. Like they were the core pieces of what our survival was. Ancestrally, dopamine is really there to say that thing will help you stay alive. That thing is gonna help you stay alive and because that's the thing that's gonna help you stay alive, you need to find it, keep going back to it, and keep engaging with it as much as possible. So it's about pleasure and reward, but if we think about it from another perspective, it's really about learning and memory and survival. So all of our brains, whether we've experienced trauma or not, are set up to go, ooh, that thing was dopaminergic. Do more of that because that's what's gonna allow us to survive. And the brain that has experienced trauma is gonna go, oh my God, find that thing, find that thing. It's gonna allow you to stay alive because what is the amygdala telling us all the time when we've experienced trauma? That there's a stressor or threat. And when I say stressor or threat, we've been kind of talking about it sort of vaguely. But if you think about if I finish that sentence, it's a stressor or a threat to our survival. So dopamine is the thing that our brain goes, oh my God, that's the thing that's gonna allow me to stay alive. Keep finding it and keep engaging with it because it keeps you safe and alive. What ancestrally, just as kind of a side note, though not really, ancestrally, what would be dopaminergic things? And just think about it for a second. What would be dopaminergic stuff? Think about it internally just for a second. What are the things? Okay. So hopefully you thought of at least a couple of the following. Human connection, because your connection is what allows you to survive. So relationships are dopaminergic. Rewarding relationships are dopaminergic. And then you should have also maybe thought about specific foods that allowed for increased survival. And those foods are the super high caloric foods. So sugar and fat are very dopaminergic because ancestrally, you're like, oh my God, I gotta get as much calories, minimal, uh, minimal punch, wait, what am I trying to say? Uh, packs a big punch in a little package, something like that. Like, where can I get the, mo the biggest bang for my buck? That's what I was going for. Where do I get the biggest bang for my buck? If you think about it just from a caloric perspective, it's gonna be berries and fatty foods, not venison and greens. So, Dopaminergic foods are fatty and sugary because those things, when we think about it ancestrally, really allow for our survival more than some of the other things. And then also sex. This thing is really pleasurable because it allows for the survival of my species. So human connection, including sex, um, and then really dopaminergic foods. And when 
our bodies, our, our bodies were adapting over time, we didn't have Facebook likes or soda on the corner 24 hours a day. Um, and we certainly didn't have methamphetamines and tobacco, well, no, we probably had some tobacco products over time as our bodies were adapting. But our bodies didn't necessarily adapt to have these like wildly dopaminergic experiences. But our bodies did adapt to say that thing is dopaminergic and produces dopamine in your nucleus accumbens. Find it as much as you possibly can and keep engaging with it because it allows for survival, especially if you're constantly under threat of losing your survival. So I'm gonna do just a quick activity that I actually don't think I have here. Um, so we're just gonna do it on the fly. Can you turn to your partner and take 20 seconds to explain what dopamine does? And I'll tell you when the 20 seconds is up. Okay, how'd it go? Was it pretty easy to describe the role of dopamine? Great. Okay, it sounds like it was pretty easy. It, ca it came relatively easy to most of you. Please feel free to come talk to me if it felt challenging or you still felt like, well, I'm not totally sure what this does. Because I want us to build on the role of dopamine here. Because remember when we talked about the long-term effects of cortisol? So up until now, we've sort of been talking about dopamine as it's connected to fight or flight response in the amygdala. And I want us now to talk about dopamine and its, um, its relationship to long-term cortisol. And it's actually not so much cortisol that I want us to talk about, but I want us to think about the fact that long-term cortisol actually makes us more inflamed and one of the things that we know about inflammation is that for whatever reason, I don't know who decided this was a good idea evolutionarily, but inflammation actually decreases our cortisol levels. Oh wait, I just thought of why. Because if you're under constant stress, you even need to find more of the dopaminergic stuff, probably. So um, cortisol levels go up, uh, then they ultimately crash, and then inflammation levels go up, and our dopamine levels go down. So when kiddos come into adulthood that have experienced a lot of traumatic stress, um, we actually know that there's, and it's, it's all very complicated and I barely understand it, and I shouldn't say we know. What I should say is we think. There's a hypothesis that these inflammatory cytokines actually decrease dopamine levels, which again makes that dopamine much more, um, salience inducing for us. And when I say salience, I mean that much more important. So everyone else is eating a bowl of ice cream and they're like, yeah, this is pretty good. You know, I love ice cream, this is great. And for the person that comes into adulthood with a dopamine deficit, they're like, whoa, I need five bowls of ice cream to feel as good as everyone else is feeling. So when we think about sort of, here's the normal human range of feeling pretty good and then feeling real, you know, here's some depression down here, here's our normal human range of where most people are hanging out, then what that means is that people are coming into adulthood or after periods of chronic stress, and they're down here from a dopamine perspective. So one bowl of ice cream hits them up to here, but it doesn't necessarily mean that five bowls gets them way up here. So we have always been thinking of addiction as a hedonistic disease. So when we first talked about it, we talked about people like pleasure and they like to get high. And the narrative is that people like to feel extra good, right? If here's our, if here's our like, here's how people are doing. When people use substances, they want to feel up here. And it's because they really like pleasure, hedons. But what we actually think based on some of this um, framework is that people that come into adulthood with a history of trauma use substances and they feel in here still. So those first couple dopamine um, buckets that get dumped when they engage in really dopaminergic substances are landing them in this range. And then if you know anything about the, the sort of um, the narrative of how substance use, my God, I said it again, story or narrative. If you, if you understand how substance use works, those first couple times you get this big dopamine burst, right? But the natural history is that you actually get less and less 
pleasure over time. So when we end up seeing people clinically, they're using substances that would otherwise be put in people closer to feeling pleasure, but by the time we see them, they're way down here from a dopamine perspective, and they just keep using because their brain, because why does their brain tell them to keep using, even though now their life is really not functional and it doesn't make them feel good anymore? Think for a second about why their brain tells them to keep using. That's the thing, you gotta find it, it's for your survival. Go back and find it and keep engaging with it because it's gonna keep you alive. You feel down here and everything's a mess, but you keep going back here because it makes you feel like it's gonna keep you alive. The brain always remembers the first hit and says, we're gonna go back there. The brain always remembers the first one. And it's part of why fentanyl is such a huge, um, is, we're really lucky in Portland that we don't see that much fentanyl, although I review UDS results on a pretty regular basis and we are seeing more and more fentanyl. But when we think about why people are engaging with fentanyl, it doesn't always make sense. But if you think about it from this perspective, Fentanyl is a chance to have the first hit again, and it's incredibly salient. So things are a mess down here, and you're like, oh, there's a, there's a way I could feel this again? Ooh, I'm gonna do that thing. That's why fentanyl is so powerful. Biggest bang for your buck, when we're thinking about like dopaminergic bang for your buck, man, fentanyl is really good. And then other things that are super dopaminergic, I haven't covered that, which I apologize for. We haven't talked about like, there's sort of gradations of dopaminergic things. And one of the most dopaminergic things is, um, is tobacco. And then meth is really close up there. And we also get, we actually get a little bit less dopamine when we get into the central nervous system suppressants. But remember how soothing they are to the amygdala? They're incredibly soothing to the amygdala. So I have a story. My client said that I could share it. Um, and I think it's such a, it's such a useful sort of demonstration of the natural history of substance use disorders and um, the, the sort of pull of dopaminergic substances. So I had a client, um, he was actually an opioid user for a long time, was in recovery, he was, um, he was working on becoming a CADC, he was taking classes at PCC, um, and then a, a bunch of hard things in his life happened, uh, he ended up homeless and he started using methamphetamines so that he could, um, so that he didn't have to sleep on the street, so that he could stay awake all night. So he started using methamphetamines, and um, if you use methamphetamines for a long enough period of time, particularly if you use them IV, which wasn't a stretch for him because he was a long time opioid user, you become pretty psychotic, right? That's the natural history of methamphetamine use. So he showed up in my office one day and he was very psychotic, and he said, Lydia, it's so weird because I'm you, I think I'm using meth, but I'm not really sure because the FBI is following me and I think they might be replacing some of it with something that's not meth, but they'll kill me if I stop. Which is a, psych, is a psychotic version of what I just told you. You keep using it because it's the only thing that's gonna make you think you're, like, that you're gonna survive and that you'll stay alive, but it doesn't feel good anymore. So I don't even, he was saying, I don't even think it's meth because it doesn't feel the same. I don't get anything from it, but if I stop, they're gonna kill me. Which again is sort of an extreme narrative of how it feels when you've progressed into your substance use. I can't stop because that's gonna feel like death that feels like I'm not gonna be able to survive, but my prefrontal cortex is super aware that things are not going well, which is where the deep ambivalence often comes in in substance use disorders, from a trauma-informed perspective, at least. So if we go back and we talk about this, these scientific gaps here in understanding how trauma ultimately begets poor um, health outcomes, one of the gaps we think is gonna be filled in by this understanding of a shift in how powerful dopamine is in our central nervous systems. So instead of saying dopamine's really about pleasure, we say dopamine's really about survival. Also, hey, it seems like trauma lessens accessible dopamine, specifically in our nucleus accumbens. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So if you wanna if you wanna keep thinking about this and just think about it from a couple different perspectives, or if you wanted to try to explain this to someone else, you'd say, okay, trauma leads to low-grade global inflammation. And that inflammation actually seems to make it so that there's decreased availability of dopamine, specifically in the nucleus accumbens, which is that pleasure and reward center in the brain, or that survival center in the brain. And another way to talk about this is trauma leads to cortisol dysregulation. Cortisol dysregulation leads to inflammation. Inflammation leads to a dopamine deficit, and that dopamine deficit means that we're hypersensitive to dopaminergic substances. So just a couple different ways to talk about that. So now we'll do a little bit more of a formal teach back. So this is an activity where I want you to get a partner again. It could be the same partner, it doesn't have to be. Um, and you've got two and a half minutes to teach this, and then we're gonna flip for another two minutes. So this is a five minute total activity. You guys ready to go? Did most of you find that you could explain it? Okay, I, I, I finally saw a couple nods. Okay, great. Um, my goal today is that you leave here and you feel not like a neuroscience expert, um, but my goal today is that you leave here and you feel like you could explain some of the core concepts, um, even very vaguely, to someone else. So I'd want you to leave here today and say, oh yeah, there was this thing about the amygdala and being hypervigilant and substances help soothe it. And then there was this other thing about dopamine and how there's a deficit in it. And then you become hypersensitive to dopaminergic things. So hopefully you felt like you could do that. And if you felt like that was a struggle, come talk to me at lunch so that we can practice it and figure out where the holes are. Um, I'm just noticing people moving. And so I don't necessarily want to take another break because um, as I was just reminded by Stacy, people aren't going to complain about leaving early on a Friday afternoon, but I thought we could just do like just a quick stand up and sort of stretch. Like stand up, move your body for a second. All right. So we've done a teach back and we've done some stretching. So let's talk about more things. So we've gotten two core things that um, describe some of the vulnerability that arises from experiencing trauma. So let's talk a little bit about neurohormonal landscape and what withdrawal is like. So it turns out that if you look neurohormonally at what is happening for people, in withdrawal, specifically from central nervous system suppressants, but really all dopaminergic substances. Um, and you look at what a, a PTSD flashback or trigger looks like neurohormonally, it turns out it's the same thing. So I'll just say it again. So neurohormonally, people have similar physiological experiences during withdrawal as they do when there's a a revisioning of a traumatic experience. And I remember the first time that I started to think about this, it was one of those, you know, you have those moments where you're like, whoa, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. Because my clients, so I'm someone in long-term recovery, um, but I've never been an opioid user. Uh, my, my withdrawals were actually pretty mild. Um, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, this makes so much sense because my clients will do literally anything to not experience that. And I never, I could never quite understand why before until I recognized the, just really the psychological impact of it. So, you know, if we were to review um, what opioid withdrawals felt like, we'd be like, yeah, whatever, like it's, it's a flu, it's a, like a mild flu, right? And yet people will go to the most astounding lengths to avoid being in opioid withdrawals. And it's because of the psychological overlay that feels so literally traumatic. So withdrawal can be literally traumatic for folks, which is why we have an obligation to change things like mandatory abstinence in jails. Um, we want to be offering buprenorphine, methadone, et cetera, in jails because we don't want another layer of trauma. Also, there's a safety issue um, post-release. 
But it's also one of the reasons that I am pro um, medication supported recovery. Because if you can uh, avoid people going through the traumatic experience of withdrawals, um, you're doing them a favor. So it's never good in terms of long term recovery. So that's number three. And then number four, um, and we sort of touched on this before, but I think it's really important. So I just want it to land as sort of a separate thing the amygdala. And remember what the amygdala does? It decides whether something is a stressor or threat and whether we should respond with fight or flight to that thing or not. The amygdala has the highest opioid receptor concentration of anywhere else in the brain. So opioids in particular have this incredible ability to make us feel safe and like the world is not a threatening place. <clears throat> so pretty powerful stuff. The other thing that I want to mention here, um, and I didn't make it number five because it's really only for people that are versed in polyvagal theory. If you don't, have never heard of polyvagal theory, just close your ears for a second because it's not that important. It's just like an interesting tidbit if you do know about polyvagal theory. So. Um, although we have a little bit of time, so I'll, I'll sort of describe polyvagal theory to you. So polyvagal theory um, is a new way of understanding uh, the central nervous system and thinking about it a little bit differently. And it's got a, it's got a really strong emphasis on social connection as being, um, as being part of our reward system and part of our survival response system. So in polyvagal theory, we say that actually our first five, uh, survival response is not fight or flight, it's social connection. So you reach out to other people first. And polyvagal theory offers a way to monitor the nervous system and see if the nervous system is well soothed or not, and we call it vagal tone. And it turns out that there's actually a lot of research around cravings and recurrence of use and vagal tone. So again, vagal tone is a way that you can monitor how um, dysregulated or regulated a nervous system is in terms of like hypervigilance and fear and connection to prefrontal cortex. And vagal tone is directly related to incidents of recurrence of use and cravings. And it, it's a chicken or egg kind of thing. Do cravings go up and then our vagal tone gets worse? Or does vagal tone get worse and then our cravings go up? My guess is, is vagal tone gets worse and our cravings go up because we know that there's a direct correlation between stress and cravings because of what we know about cortisol and dopamine. And how many of you guys have seen with your clients or maybe in your own life, people doing pretty well. They seem to have a lot of skills. They seem to really like have um, garnered some stuff around self-actualization and how to self-soothe and then something awful happens and the cravings skyrocket and there's a recurrence of use. So common. I mean, it's just, that's the, and that's one, and I think this is something that someone was trying to get to earlier, which is so much of what we focus on then if we do, um, if we're doing building skills with people, so much of what we focus on is building those self-soothing skills to increase vagal tone for people so that cravings and then um, subsequent recurrence of use is lessened because we know this is a, a chronic illness that includes recurrence of use. So we covered four ways, four sort of neuroscience ways in which um, trauma makes us more vulnerable to developing substance use disorders. And what I'd like to do now, because we have a little bit of time before lunch, we're actually really good on time and doing well. Um, I want to just take a moment and then do the same activity that we did earlier this morning in thinking about what are the stories we hear about addiction? What are the beliefs that we have been told to carry with us about what causes addiction and who addicts are? And I want you guys to do the same thing. So at your table, pick a scribe. My preference is that you pick a new scribe this time, but you can stick with the old one. And you've got about five minutes. Actually, I'll go a little bit over five minutes. And I want you to just jot down as many things as you can think of about 
who addicts are and why people use substances. Okay, go. Okay, so that was 10 minutes. Did you guys feel like you had enough time to do that? I started to hear um, conversations that were not related to this, so I hope that that meant that there was enough time to get through it. Uh, so I would love to do just a report back. Um, we don't necessarily need to be as formal as per table, um, but just sharing a couple of the sort of core themes that came out, and we can have um, a little bit more time to share this time around. Who would like to start us off? Yeah, our uh, table, we, we were kind of like, well, maybe we already talked about this before because we didn't want to open up our dark side too much in the earlier conversation. But you mean you didn't follow my clear instructions? We did not. <laughs> we broke the rules. Um, yeah, we got there. Um, but this conversation, we really maybe took it a step further and started talking about like the the, the outcome of like um, decisions and beliefs and how that influences policy in like how we design our treatment system or how we do shelter or housing um, that are all kind of connected to this bigger question of like what what is uh, addiction and what causes addiction um, and yeah I think that was a, a conversation that was useful to have because we realized that a lot of the the narratives uh, are actually kind of the the past narrative you know the the narrative about choice and yeah, immoral behavior that drive our, our treatment and drive our, um, our, our whole system that supports folks. Yeah. Uh. yeah, that was so well said. So just, it's, if I could just quick recap, the stigma embedded in historical narratives around what causes addiction and who people that use drugs are influences the treatment that we offer people, the housing we offer people, the policies that we write that influence people's lives, the funding that different programs get, and on and on and on. Yeah, thank you. Who else would like to share? Just, just to piggyback on that, you know, I'm, I'm curious about the gaps in the pyramid. Like, um, are, those, are those proportional? You know, are those to scale? Because those gaps, like, like, um, like, like we were hearing, uh, can actually change the treatment with the other inputs that, that we're not getting can actually sway where those fundings are going. Yeah, so is your question, uh, is it about these gaps here, yes. these scientific gaps? Yes. So what, so what I hear you saying is if we really can zone in on some of the causes of addiction, which may not be reduced down to one or two, but if we could really zone in on the causes of addiction, the way that we treat addiction, the interventions we provide would be changed. Possibly. Okay. Great. I don't have the list in front of me, but one of the things that um, really come up for us is the, um, what Portugal did 18 years ago in the study around a person's cage uh, or the rat's cage, rat park, et cetera. Rat park. Yeah. And what, what struck me is that that really addresses the social determinants of health. When they decriminalized all drugs, saying it wasn't about addiction, it was about connection, that really made a huge impact on how I saw it personally. So. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so that's actually, um, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up Portugal and even more glad, is that the right word, gladder? Uh, very pleased that you brought up Rat Park, um, because when we look at historical narratives around what causes addiction, one of the things that people, 10 years ago if I had asked that question, one of the things that would invariably come up is that it's the drugs themselves that cause addiction. So if you give someone opioids for four weeks in a row, then everyone is gonna develop an addiction to opioids. Almost everyone's gonna develop a tolerance, a tissue dependence and um, they're gonna have withdrawal symptoms. But that doesn't mean people are gonna start to engage in use disorder-like behavior, where their use becomes out of control in comparison to the consequences that they're experiencing in their life. 
And so one of the things, and I think Rat Park um, has some methodological flaws, but it's a really fascinating study that gave rats access to incredibly dopaminergic substances. And the rats would engage with the dopaminergic substances to harm until they put the rats in with other rats and gave them things to play on and a ways to connect with each other. And then they found that the rats almost never engaged in harmful dopaminergic consumption. They found that the rats just went along with their lives and, and didn't overconsume, which is reflected in when we think about um, soldiers coming back from Vietnam, a lot of trauma, and yet a lot of people were using opioids when they were serving in Vietnam, and a very, very small proportion of ca people came back with disordered use to opioids. So we wanna really, um, we wanna really kind of get in there and make distinctions that drugs themselves aren't the causes of addiction. Drugs are just substances. Facebook is just a social media platform. But what causes addiction is often a compulsory need to engage with dopaminergic substances. So thank you for bringing up Portugal and specifically thanks for bringing up um, Rat Park because I do think that that is a key place where we want to be changing the narrative. Cocaine doesn't cause cocaine addiction. What causes cocaine use disorder, a stimulant use disorder, is an overwhelming drive to seek dopaminergic substances. And the reasons for seeking dopaminergic substances are varied. They're genetic, they're environmental, and they have a lot to do with life experience. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I was just in court with uh, somebody today, and, you know, having been, ex you know, uh, having experience in the court system, you know, we were talking about how back in the day, like a long time ago, if a case manager would have wrote a letter saying, yeah, you know, he has experienced some relapse, but, you know, he's doing all these other good things, the judge would have thrown him in jail just for a relapse. And mm -hmm. so educating the system, you know, is really important to like what we're learning more about brain chemistry. It's going to be like an evolution of understanding that will, uh, you know, you know, have these people that are involved in making policy, as Mike said, or in the system, you know, changing their perspectives on what addiction really is. And um, and the thing about the ACEs, I noticed uh, when I first, you know, they had all this data on all the negative aspects of, you know, chronic stress and trauma. Mm -hmm. And then there was one little blurb at the end that talked about, but studies have shown that, you know, connection with people in your community, and it was just like a little small little paragraph on, you know, like, be, you know, how being connected with the community and, and people in general can really benefit and, and you know, work towards, uh, you know, you know, reducing, you know, the, you know, the hypo, you know, hypervigilance or whatever, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, learning more about this uh, brain, you know, brain chemistry and stuff like that and trying to, you know, I mean, for I mean, I, maybe a lot of us have had repetitive information about the brain, you know. But for somebody that's new, you know, it can be rather overwhelming, you know, to learn about uh, the brain and the different, you know, the amygdala and the hippocampus and all that. But I, I've learned through repetitive, you know, that I, I learn more and more about it as I go. But I think it's important to educate, you know, spread out the education. So that's why I think, you know, sharing, having us share with each other really benefits, you know, us in sending it out into the community. Yeah, thanks. So let me see if I can, um, can pull out a couple of key points. Um, it sounds like another nod to why this information is so important, because when we decrease stigma, we actually can make changes in treatment and um, policy and funding. Um, I also heard you do a call out for we need to understand resilience more, what builds resilience. We need to focus on that more, absolutely. Um, and then uh, a call out to the ways in which um, substance use disorders are a chronic relapsing illness. So what we know about opioid use disorder in particular is, um, is that people usually seek treatment a total of seven times. And somewhere in there, something shifts but relapse is the norm 
And so whenever I'm working with someone that, um, that has experienced a recurrence of use uh, multiple times, I never envision it as a failure. I always am sort of thinking to myself like, well, we just checked off number five. All right, that one was number six. Next one's gonna be number seven, or next one might be number nine. Um, so every treatment attempt is not a failure. It's just a way for us to promote connection with people, to show them that treatment providers love them and care for them, and that we're a safe place to come to even after a recurrence of use. And then the other thing I heard was just a call out around adult learning theory, uh, which is not totally connected to this, but a little bit because it's useful with our clients. We need to hear things at least three times before they embed into our nervous system. So the key points of today, you should have heard me say them five times by the end of today. And that's just an interesting thing. If you want clients to know something, like what time they're supposed to show up for group, maybe let's say, you need to tell it to them at least three times and be thinking about the fact that their prefrontal cortex is not totally online. So you probably need to tell it to them six times and have them write it down while you watch them so that it can really get embedded into their brain. Adult learning theory really says that we need to hear things, is that me? Did I do that? Multiple times um, to have it land for us. So yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, who else wanted to report back on narratives? I'm sorry, it's not a report back. I just thought I'd um, um, kind of connect with what you were just saying about relapse. And yeah. I've been, I've been clean for 23 years. And one of the things that um, I kept hearing back in the day was relapse was part of the process, right? Mm -hmm. But what they weren't clearly defining is that actually relapse is a state of mind and behaviors before you actually pick up and use. Mm -hmm. And so if we can share that message specifically, I think that's a, a vital message for people to start to go inward and look and recognize that, that they can, they can uh, stop that process before they pick up and use. And um, our state it, um, just recently passed legislation of a House bill to, for an impacts, which is uh, about $10 million that will set up hubs around the state to address some of these things and decriminalize um, or keep people with addictions to mental health out of the criminal justice system. So I wonder how much of um, this particular presentation might be um, offered to some of these individuals that are going to be applying for these types of grants, if you will, to be part of those hubs. Because if we're really looking at it through the lens of holistic and trauma-informed and ACEs and experiences, for me, I don't have, um, which I don't have cravings for meth. What I do have is purpose. I have a lot of things that I've given back. So that's what keeps me clean today. So I'm just wondering how can we look at it through the lens of not a criminalizing, um, criminalizing individuals that have addiction and there isn't one pathway to addiction. So that's where I see a barrier in our state, having this mindset that this is the way, right? Rather than honoring the whole person and looking through the lens of self-actualization, self-determination. So thank you for all of this. Yeah, absolutely. I want to, um, I'd like to move us on to shifting to talking about trauma-informed care. So hopefully what we've done this morning is to really lay the groundwork of why a trauma-informed perspective on substance use disorders is so dang important. So you guys already started generating these ideas well before I brought them, which is when we understand substance use disorders to be intimately connected to trauma and life experiences, and we're talking about trauma as something much bigger than just individual trauma, it starts to shift the way we think about how we would treat people. And it shifts the way we think about whether we should criminalize people or offer them treatment. When we think about the way that we protect kiddos who experience harm in our communities, and we think about the fact that it's those very same kiddos who turn 18 and then engage in behavior that their, um, their brains really have set them up to immediately engage with, and then we criminalize or punish that behavior, we're really doing people a great disservice, 